Hello everyone, my name is Jennifer Mangino and I'm with Tactical Flex Inc. Uh, first of all, I would like to thank everyone for joining us here on this exciting webinar in which we have Matt Jockman, a well-known figure in the information security industry, as our guest speaker. Matt, thank you for this great opportunity and for being here. Just a brief background, Matt Jockman is the CTO of Emerging Threats and president of the Information Security Foundation. We have invited Matt to discuss the benefits and features of Sericata, the next generation open source IDS engine, and to share information regarding Emerging Threats' latest research regarding malware. So just a little bit of information regarding our agenda. Matt Jockman will start off with an overview of Emerging Threats and introduce Suricata IDS open source technology. I will then provide an overview of Anvil SAS and the business benefits. Eric Smith, our customer relationship manager, will also provide a demonstration of Anvil SAS. So we'll have a Q&A at the end, uh, depending on the time. I will now turn the presentation over to Matt Jockman. Today, as uh, Jennifer mentioned, um, I want to talk about a few new things we see in malware and Emerging Threats. Uh, some of the things we're doing with those in the rule set, and then ultimately <clears throat> what we've done with uh, Suricata, which is a new open source IDS to help address some of these new threats and uh, uh, things that we face. So Emerging Threats is, uh, was originally an open source community and still is very strong, a really good place to uh, keep a pulse on what's new in malware, what's new in the community, and um, some of the new signatures. We run an open source rule set that is still free, BSD licensed, and, and very active and pushes every day. And that supports Snort and Suricata, as well as Emerging Threats Pro, which is a company we've started up the last few years around that open source community to do a lot of different things. And uh, we also are, uh, provide IP and DNS reputation services and tools there as well. So, uh, sorry hitting buttons too many times. So talking about malware, um, the primary motivations we, we've all known for a long time, cash, uh, making money, generally uh, meals from banks, snagging credit cards, um, a lot of different things have been around forever. And that's the mainstream malware that really still is the majority of what's there. But we have uh, two more, certainly more threatening and uh, uh, sometimes more interesting things out there these days, uh, information, uh, espionage, and uh, uh, electronic warfare, which are uh, both information espionage is certainly very, very prevalent, has been for quite a few years. Um, electronic warfare uh, coming to the surface has been practiced, but uh, uh, not on gigantic scale yet. Uh, but we'll see what's uh, coming around the corner for that. It's certainly an interesting development in our industry. So uh, we're, we're still really looking at what the bots want primarily is cash. That's what's hitting us as enterprises, as corporations, universities, um, in general, they're looking for credit card numbers, as I mentioned, bank accounts, uh, account credentials, and the, it's still the normal, the same kind of crime we've always seen, but we're seeing much more sophisticated malware um, trying to take advantage of these things. Um, new command and control methods, new uh, families, quite a different, a number of different infection vectors, um, which is really one of the biggest changes. So. Here is a sample of the number of unique Windows 32 only binaries we've collected over a one week period I collected uh, last month. And uh, the numbers are still this high and higher. They fluctuate a good deal. But we're seeing in the range of 150,000 to 250,000 unique Windows binaries a day. And only maybe 10 or 15% of that are the polymorphic uh, families like all Apple and such that um, every copy of the virus or the, the Trojan is intentionally different. Um, so these, this is not a fluff of you know half all apples like that. We're seeing incredible numbers of new unique binaries every day. Um, a comparison to that same week in 2011, uh, two years ago, a significant difference. We were in the 5,000, maybe 10,000 a day on really, really good days. In just a few years, a couple of years, um, we've seen this incredible spike, and it's been on a steady um, increase, and there's no sign it's going to drop. Uh, the only limits to what we collect now are um, infrastructure and uh, collection methods. I mean, there's a lot more that exists out there that isn't necessarily collected by uh, um, researchers like ourselves. So this is an interesting 
graphic from Sophos, the uh, uh, Sophos is a infection malware report for from 2012. We my we built all of our defenses against the direct attack, um, attacking an open service, attacking a vulnerable service, attacking a vulnerable web server. But we've come now in the last year and a half or two years, suddenly that's not the infection vector to get to a user or get to a network. As you can see here, um, exploit kits, especially black hole, are, are so prevalent that they're broken out and everything else is in the 3.4%. That 3.4% are the, uh, um, the things we've built all our defenses against, which is something that we've, um, we've had to change quickly in the last year or two and, and um, I hope we're doing it well. We still have a long way to go though. Um, it is incredibly easy for your end user to get hit by black hole in particular and any of the exploit kits. There are uh, probably 40 or 50 active exploit kits um, for sale that are just doing the redirection exploit and drop whatever you want. And that dropped executable that runs, that's what's in the uh, uh, 250,000 uniques that we're um, catching every day. So it's not so much the, the bad guys don't have to spend their time building a botnet or finding an exploit or going somewhere. It's essentially outsourced to um, organizations like uh, Black Hole, Neosploit, Secura. They do the exploitation. They'll bring the bots to you. You just put a binary in there that you can talk to. So we have to assume, knowing how easy it is for a bad guy to get bots and to get executables run on one of your end users' computers, we have to assume that that infection is going to happen. So if we assume that it could happen, it will happen, there may be one on my network already, the Achilles heel of that infection is that it has to communicate with somebody. And we still, we definitely have the tools that are effective at monitoring network traffic for um, any kind of communications that we're aware of. So a few examples of uh, simple yet quite effective command and control mechanisms. This here, the user agent, is an encoded string, and the, uh, uh, the URI is pretty much irrelevant in this case. Another similar um, encoded user agent, you know, very easy things to build, easy for the bad guys to use, and really easy for that to blend in with normal traffic. Uh, another very interesting one of late, covert DNS channels. So this is using actually the our own DNS infrastructure against us. And we've seen bots with this using just DNS lookups and responses move gigabytes of information in, within hours. So essentially the, uh, the lookup is to a non-existent subdomain, but it's an encoded request. And then the reply to this will be a text plot, uh, a normal DNS text response. So you can put a, a rather large string in there, basic to four encoded, XOR, whatever you want to do to make it tough to read. And the bot and the bad guy can have direct communication without ever having a direct connection. So the, this communication goes through Google's DNS server or through your DNS server, and the DNS servers communicate um, often indirectly, but quickly and effectively. These things are they're prevalent. There are probably 60 or 70 domains that we're tracking right now that are being used for this, um, and they're all over the board. Uh, they're, and they're, they're relatively easy for us to catch with intrusion detection systems, but they're very difficult to keep up with. So something new, um, Android. This is a uh, uh, request that we caught in our Android fan netting recently. Uh, it looks like a regular post, um, and just about every piece of Android that we analyze, that we see installed, is posting something about the user, and it's hitting a, an ad server, and it's pulling back ads, which is relatively normal spyware ad tracking stuff. But here we happen to notice, thankfully, SMS, name, address, body, um, phone number, durations, a little more than your average uh, spyware. So to take this and break it out a little bit, uh, it was uh, actually nicely formatted JSON, so broken up to be a little more human readable. Um, uh, pretty easy to figure out. These were just plain base 64 encoded fields after each, uh, or values after each field. And once decoded, of course, that's enough to get you a little worried. Uh, so the, the Android 
saying that, that this was run on, had some fake contacts in the phone, some fake SMSs in its history, and the fake call logs, and then uh, some URLs that it had been to. So as soon as this malware, uh, Android malware, which is a fake app, as soon as it ran, it snagged everything off that phone and sent it. And then it can interact with SMS commands back and forth, which makes it really difficult for us to catch because we can't generally monitor an SMS network. So moving forward to the uh, ET Pro rule set, um, as I mentioned, we are an open source community as well as a commercial rule set as well. What we do different at Emerging Threats, which we uh, think gives an, a great advantage to all of us as uh, defenders of our networks, is we take uh, a bit like an antivirus approach that we take every binary, we collect every binary we can, we run them, and we run it through our system. If our rule set catches the command and control connection and identifies the family, then we call it good. We have enough information there that um, us all as end users and defenders could say, well, something happened, here's a command and control session going on, and I know it's Zeus, or I know it's um, whatever family it is, so I can react appropriately. And we can kill the command and control session, so hopefully if it is an infection on our net, it's essentially been neutered because it never got the phone home. It's still an infected PC, so I have to clean it and uh, do your normal incident response, but with luck, it never got to talk to anybody. It never got to exfiltrate information. That's the key part. So with the Emerging Threats Pro rules and with our open rule set, uh, we publish every day. We're looking at five to 20 new rules every day. And what I didn't mention on the last slide, for every sample that we have come through that does not automatically hit on an existing rule in our uh, rule set, we apply the humans to. We group, we triage, and we write new signatures. And that's how we're putting out five to 20 new rules every single day. Now, I automatically think uh, a performance impact um, as long as we, we keep obsoleting rules and we write these new rules effectively, uh, the performance impact of adding up to 50 or 100 new rules a week is, is really negligible, as long as they're written well, which we work very hard on in our daily QA process. So something different with uh, emerging threats, we're the only rule set, open or commercial, that supports multiple engines. So we um, support Snort all the way from 2.4 up to very current, Suricata, all versions, and some other proprietary as well. And really, um, the way we can cover malware and the way the open community, the Emerging Threats Open community, helps us cover exploit kits uh, is second to none. It's really the best way to get where you want to be. And here's really where we've tried to change the industry of late in that we used to concentrate our research um, resources on direct exploits, vulnerabilities. If your CVE list was longer than the other guy, then your IDS device must be better. That doesn't really matter anymore. Uh, nobody's attacking us directly with the entire list of CVEs. They're going after what's effective against Java, Adobe, Flash. And generally there's six, seven, eight active at any time that are going to work on about any PC you go to. So where we really have to focus is on the command and control sessions to make sure if something gets through our frontline defenses, we're going to detect that it was there. So here we come to Suricata. Uh, the bad guys are getting very good at evading us. They've been watching what we do with signatures and our open side commercial as well. Uh, they know how to evade us. So we, in the Open Information Security Foundation, um, we were funded by DHS three four years ago to kickstart building a new engine, start from the ground up and go forward. And a lot of things with other open source engines were right and perfect. Um, uh, Snort, for example, the language is great. Um, the engine's very efficient, but there were a lot of new things we wanted to do, including primarily get multi-threading to work. So with Suricata, we've built a consortium of a lot of companies, VARs, vendors, uh, hardware manufacturers, and here's a small sample of those that support the engine that have uh, contributed to development, that have contributed technology, because all of these vendors want to try to build a new product that, that does IDS better, but their secret sauce is a, a GUI or an event correlator or acceleration or some other thing. Nobody in the industry really sells an IDS engine. 
uh, but we all need one that works well. And um, we were hoping for and we were happy to find out that the industry is also willing to collaborate to make a great engine that we can all use effectively. And then every company in the industry adds their secret sauce around that. And that's working well, we believe. So your top reasons that I would like to propose to you that you would try Suricata. Uh, it's a great engine and it's free. It's a very nice thing, the free bit. But multi-threaded. Um, Suricata, to our knowledge, is the only multi-threaded IDS engine out there. And being at a, an incredible brick wall in performance, um, not being able to thread is an incredible disadvantage because our processors aren't getting faster. All we're getting are more processors on the box. So Suricata being able to thread out with a very efficient threading manager uh, to manage multiple streams at a time and process multiple packets at a time um, makes it pretty much the sky's the limit as servers and motherboards expand and get uh, more processors, faster buses, this engine will be able to keep up. We won't have to run 40 Suricatas and hope that an attack goes to the same one every time we can run one engine that has global state that can do thresholding across everything. Automatic protocol detection. So some of those HTTP uh, CNC examples I showed earlier, um, the best way to evade most existing IDSs was to just hop to an odd port, port 65,000. Um, and tomorrow use port 10,000 and the day after use port 15,000 because uh, the way HTTP is normalized in most other engines, you have to give it the ports to normalize on. With Suricata, uh, with HTTP and with many other protocols, it makes a verdict after the first couple packets, say, yep, this is an HTTP stream, and then applies all the HTTP rules to that, regardless of the port it's on. Uh, this is not only an, a great accuracy gain, because we can write one rule for an HTTP-based command and control uh, protocol, and it'll hit on any port up and down the scale, but it's also a performance game because we're not trying to normalize traffic that's not HTTP just because it's on by chance one of the ports we think HTTP might be on. Native hardware acceleration support um, for the very high end and for folks that have to do unusual things with their engine. Um, a lot of the vendors in the industry like uh, Endace, Miracom, Emulex, uh, Enpulse that build acceleration hardware are part of our consortium and helped build in natively to Suricata uh, the use of their, their technology. So if you compile Suricata um, in an environment with a Miracom card, it's going to know that, it's going to use it, it's not going to, you're not going to have to wait for the vendor to give you patches, things like that. It's just going to work. One of the things I really like, IP reputation at speed. So we can take um, an incredibly large list of IPs and very shortly DNS domain names uh, will be also kept in memory. You can take those and not only pre-match on those to say, hey, this is a known command and control server IP. I don't want to talk to it, so block it before we process. But Suricata can also use that in the rule set language. So you can give as many categories and scores, thresholds as you want to the engine. And then in the rule say this, this, and this happens, and it has a reputation as a command and control server over whatever threshold I'm comfortable with, then take action. So it's not just a blind drop preprocessor for IP matching and, and shortly domains, but you can also query in a rule you know, where it's listed, what other things it is. Uh, it's a very, very powerful thing. Suricata has a very cute mascot. Um, a meerkat is our, our mascot. Suricata is part of the Latin genus name for, uh, for a meerkat. So. And it's really easy to snag cute meerkat pictures from National Geographic, as you see that one plagiarized there. Um, Suricata has a snort-like syntax. Um, it's one of the, the default language of our industry, of the security industry, is snort. Um, everybody speaks it, whether you're using it or not. Uh, we've added a lot of things to the, um, to the language, to the syntax, to take advantage of Suricata's features. But at the core, um, if you know that snort syntax, Suricata rules are going to look just perfectly sensible. A very interesting thing here, file extraction, identification, and MD5 sim matching. Um, I could talk about this for hours, but essentially in uh, a number of supportive protocols, HTTP included, you can 
using the Unix utility files magic byte database, you can identify a file in stream with that database, not just based on extension or uh, what's reported as the actual magic bytes of the file. And this can happen at network speed. You can match on that. You can say, well, this thing by magic bytes is an executable, but by attachment it says it's a .pdf. I would like to flag that in an, in an email, in a uh, uh, HTTP stream. Obviously, that's probably bad. Um, you can take another step. You can then extract that file, or you can extract any file based on any characteristic, size, magic bytes, type, extension, or that it just exists. You can extract that right at the disk, do things with it. And as well, MD5 some in stream. So we can take you know, large lists of known bad MD5s, and we've tested with 40 or 50 million MD5s and been able to still keep wire speed. So that it's a little bit of a kludge um, setup because we know viruses change so quickly, but we can also use this the opposite direction. We get MD5 files that are important to us to keep in our network and uh, alert if they leave. SSL analysis and logging, uh, I think this is my last point on this as well. Um, in the age of the DigiNotar breaches and compromised certificates, Suricata has a TLS preprocessor or a parser that will log and let you know when things change. So say you're going to Google, Google has one SSL cert across to everything. Uh, if you're going there and suddenly, well, I have a valid cert, but it's not like the one I just had, uh, that's a very important thing. That means you probably have a, a compromised certificate being used with one of your users. That's something you can alert on now with Suricata. A uh, very effective tool, very effective for data mining in the past as well. So, performance-wise, Suricata being multi-threaded is an incredible advantage. So here's a box we use a lot in a, a number of different places in our own um, research and data gathering. Uh, it's a 16-core, pretty standard Intel Xeon, uh, 2.7 gigahertz, 32 gig of RAM. The only unusual thing is a, a really good quality Intel uh, NIC. So it's a round. Uh, just under $5,000 for that hardware, probably a little less now, it's getting a little older. That's sitting on a number of links, but one I'll show you here is running at least 9.6 gig a second sustained. It's running almost 10,000 rules out of our ET Pro rule set, uh, tuned down a little bit, no packet loss at nearly 10 gig a second on commodity hardware. No acceleration, no capture buffering, stock stuff. Um, that's that's a $50,000, $80,000 sensor, with generally with most existing commercial solutions. Um, you can do it yourself for $5,000. And here's a, a, a snapshot of an HTOP running on that box. Uh, and I think at this point it was around 9 gig a second um, and been there for quite a while. With that rule set, we're using PF Ring as a capture tool, capture library. And you can see around 70, 75% utilization across all 16 cores but one instance of Suricata running threaded out. So we have global complete awareness of all that traffic going through all the streams, thresholding is effective on a $5,000 box with free software. So we're happy with that. So uh, in summary, with Suricata, 10 gig plus, you can do that on commodity hardware. If you're under there, um, revive an old sensor, it'll probably do great with Suricata. Uh, with the Emerging Threats Pro and the ET Open rule set, new command and control channels. We have to focus on command and control. There will be infections. We have to accept that. We need to catch when they're there and stop them before they get somewhere. Daily rule set updates, especially to track the exploit kits. If you're not updating daily, um, by the time you do update, the change is irrelevant. Uh, a lot of the exploit kits, uh, especially black hole, are starting to change three, every three or four days or weekly at the longest. If you're not getting updates daily, uh, you're, you're probably not going to get it. They're going to be owned, unfortunately. Um, so Suricata, commodity hardware, incredible, incredible performance, and very cost effective. Uh, and contact information here, I'd love to have any questions or hit me up directly as well. Yonkman or mYonkman at emergingthreats.net. Uh, join our open communities at Emerging Threats. Uh, we have several mailing lists that are highly technical and on the, the leading edge of what's going on. And it's just discussion, people asking good questions. You'll learn a lot if you're not already there. And uh, information about Suricata and the Open, open Information Security Foundation 
Uh, we, if you have ideas, things you want your ideas to do, or would like to contribute code or help us document or anything, we, we really appreciate the help and volunteers. And back over to you, Jennifer. Thank you, Matt, for your informative presentation. So um, if you had an opportunity to download Anvil, attend a live demo, or have visited our website, um, you'll find that Anvil is actually aimed at helping um, various physicians within the IT department, um, including system admin, um, IT managers, um, security analysts, information security officers, security researchers, and network engineers effectively manage and monitor the network infrastructure as well as create operational efficiency. So Anvil overall, um, it helps IT departments focus and get back to protecting their network you know, by building systems that allow security professionals uh, to be able to make determinations quickly while being well informed. So today um, we will provide uh, insights, valuable insights on why IT departments are embracing Anvil SAS. And um, what are the capabilities of Anvil and the contributing factors to Anvil's popularity and global success? We'll show you. Okay, so Tactical Flex Inc. has been building information security, vulnerability, and risk management solutions since 2003. So we protect and monitor over 6,000 customers worldwide, and we believe that security is not a one-time purchase product, but a process that is continually changing as technology evolves. Um, and we're always, we always have been in the forefront of recognizing both industry and general technology advancement, as well as advances in security threats. Okay, so in today's cyber battlefield, uh, which is pretty dangerous, attacks against the private and public sectors are continually evolving and targeting more and more organizations of all sizes. And we believe that today's IT security professionals need to assess and review their current security technology tools with an eye towards the evolving security threat environment. So knowing exactly what is going on inside the network in real time is more important than ever. So why are companies on the front line of data protection and information security investing in Anvil SAS? Because um, we provide security intelligence, security automation, and offensive tools that help shore up defenses and turn data into actionable and comprehensive insights in order to reduce risk and help make informed decisions. So what is Anvil SAS? The SAS and AMBL stands for Situational Awareness System. AMBL is the industry's most comprehensive snort, suricata, and syslog intrusion detection, correlation, and threat management. Um, it operates using suricata and snort in order to correlate real-time IDS, IPS logs, um, create alerts as needed from various, and as well, uh, create alerts as needed from various vendors, such as Cisco, Barracuda, and others. Anvil SAS overall was designed to heighten the level of real-time security monitoring, security intelligence, and speed up incident response. Anvil also delivers a new level of security intelligence so that it can make sense of all the captured log uh, data, thus effectively strengthening an organization's security posture. Uh, the real world of Anvil can be used for a variety of situations. Uh, for example, email alerts when a rogue device comes online, alerts of a certain database or Apache error, rogue login or authentication attempts, as well as general charts and graphs um, to report on network security status system-wide. What are the business benefits of Anvil? Uh, the first one is operational efficiency. Anvil reduces the amount of time spent on reviewing log records and managing network activities and user activities. Uh, for example, Anvil can record about 1,500 events per second and can scale with appropriate hardware to record as many as 5,000 events per second. Anvil's automated database management uh, simplifies the security tasks of capturing and managing a large number of security events, um, as well as creating valuable reports and delivering real-time alerts. Um, in addition, Anvil can successfully solve uh, the challenging tasks of managing and archiving an unlimited amount of real-time and historical events. So this automated capability uh, helps deliver accurate event correlation al analysis and uh, provides an efficient way uh, to search and locate event data without losing valuable time. Uh, so uh, overall, AMBL uh, uh, drives operational efficiency through the intelligent use of automation technology. Uh, we, uh, there's 
the other benefit of improving security by accelerating detections of threats. So, I mean, we all know that early detection of security incidents uh, mitigates security risk as well as prevent security threats and malicious security breaches from actualizing and causing network downtime. So ANVIL's threat management technology uh, provides greater intelligence and network visibility so IT departments uh, can quickly respond to high-risk security events by accelerating the detection and alerting of uh, possible attacks. Um, so our approach, our intrusion detection approach to security threat management uh, actually helps organizations proactively seek out potential problems before they actualize and instead of operating in a reactive mode after attacks have occurred. What are the, uh, the five specific security use cases Anvil can help solve? Um, the first one is to achieve greater security intelligence and network visibility through situational awareness. Um, the second one is early detection of security incidents. Um, the third one is to provide comprehensive and efficient reporting. Uh, fourth is to manage IT resource deficiency. And uh, the last one is deliver crucial operational efficiency. There are four things you may not know about Anvil. Uh, did you know that Anvil is uniquely and completely written in standard HTML and JavaScript, and more importantly, void of Adobe Flash? Uh, this important uh, key factor means that Anvil is completely rewritten has a rewritten code base and they, which enables Anvil to work in every browser and across every mobile platform. Uh, did you also know that Anvil is designed uh, to correlate event data and logs for hundreds of vendor products and solutions? And, can, and it can also support millions and billions of Suricata stored as syslog events. And it's fully automated as long as storage space is available. And uh, Anvil is also an enterprise grade IDS solution created for all business sizes and has the unique uh, technological capability um, to automatically scale to meet the needs of this environment. So Anvil um, overall is built to scale from small single sensor installations uh, to global enterprise deployment. Uh, the intrusion detection industry has three key challenges um, across different applications regarding te um, technology innovation. Uh, uh, the first one is the lack of situational awareness. Uh, the second one, is the high volume of false alarms and problems of scale, uh, scalability and deployment in large, large organizations. Um, Anvil um, overall is designed for better threat management performance and we will explore how Anvil can help provide uh, these uh, technological solutions. So I will now turn the presentation over to Eric Smith uh, from our support department and he will provide a demonstration of Anvil SAS. Some of the great things about our latest versions in Anvil SAS are going to be some multiple views in which you can view data. Um, and as you see here, we have a timeline browser, which gets a bit more detailed on its own screen. Um, and before, uh, I guess I just want to highlight, especially, um, and again, thank you for Matt for joining us today and speaking about Suricata, because one of the very uh, handy tools that we've incorporated with Anvil uh, is the ability to communicate directly with the sensor itself. It can be uh, quite the task to, uh, from the command line visit, uh, I mean, different categories of rule sets, uh, scroll through thousands of rules, comment, uncomment rules. Uh, that's a job that you can do all from the web interface right here on Anvil. And I'll just show you quick uh, how we can do that. Now, first of all, again, before you can start uh, actually managing the, the sensor itself, uh, you're, you're going to be wanting to get rules. Again, you can get them directly from emerging threats. They have, as Matt covered, uh, fantastic rules and updated all the time. And so first of all, within our signature sources menu, um, Anvil has the option to download rules directly from uh, various sources. Uh, you can upload local rule sets, get them directly from Snort, emerging threats. And it's a very simple uh, task of easily setting it up. Uh, to essentially providing the location, um, and it lets you know exactly when those things were last downloaded. Now, additionally, Anvil has the option to download those updates as they come. And so these uh, updates you will see daily as you're seeing those updates directly from emerging threats. So again, we can grab those new updates automatically, uh, again, as emerging threats pushes them out. And then from that, we can go right to our signature management page and here 
we see all of our different categories, first seeing uh, how many rules are actually active on the sensor as opposed to how many we have available to activate. And just as an example, I'm gonna go right to our bad traffic rules here. So we have an option uh, to select whatever uh, rules we actually wanna activate. Uh, we get an idea as to what's going on here. Uh, and both Snort and Emerging Threats, um, they're providing more information on exactly what these rules mean, what they can do, uh, and even some courses of action to take should they uh, actually be activated and you see events starting to roll in from them. Uh, so we can uh, activate what rules we want. We can just simply enable all of them and, and just update the policy. From here, it's just then a, a simple task of going uh, actually to our sensor management screen here. And this is where we can see the configuration. And this can be uh, immediately grabbed from the sensor itself. And this is something we can modify. And just with a simple task of sending messages to this sensor, we can do a number of things to stop, start, uh, and restart the sensor. We can also send and receive rules and configurations. Now, one of the great things about this tool is that it's extremely secure because we're uh, essentially just sending some simple ping uh, messages back and forth. As you can see up top, we're sending mass messages back and forth to the sensor, making sure it's there, making sure it's online, um, even then sending out emails should it fail. But with these ping messages, there, as, you, as you can see from the drop-down list, there are only so, so many messages that can be sent and received uh, to these sensors. Um, and, they, and again, they're very basic. So essentially where the security comes in is that no one is, is going to be able to uh, hack, upload viruses, whatever they want uh, to your Snort or Suricata sensors. They're not gonna be doing it through Anvil. Uh, sure, they may find another way in, uh, but Anvil is not gonna be the culprit of it. And so it's a very secure system. And so after we made those changes, it just then comes down to sending those messages to send the rules, send the configuration and restart the sensor to make sure those uh, changes then take effect. So just some very handy tools that you can use all within the web interface to manage your sensors. Now, as Jennifer mentioned, Anvil SAS, SAS meaning Situational Awareness System, uh, this is a very important idea uh, and feature to us uh, because, again, we believe in network visibility and our latest packages and builds revolve around this idea of situational awareness that we want you to feed Anvil everything you can from your sensors. Uh, and again, SuriCob is a great tool to do that because as it's multi-threaded, you're not, you're not going to really be missing packets and Anvil can handle all of those packets. As Jennifer mentioned, this thing will be processing up to 5,000 events a second. Uh, again, make sure you have the right hardware for it. Um, and that's something we also offer in our different appliances. Um, but this is a, a, just a great system to have full network visibility. We want you to, again, see everything that's on your network. But not only see all your events, we want you to see all of your devices. Now, the way the situational awareness comes into effect, uh, and it's actually an Kind of an older idea dating actually the term itself dating to world war one where those in charge they needed to know uh, what personnel they had what they could do um, and have the most up-to-date information so that they could make those informed decisions and this is working in much the same way and so as we detail to anvil what devices are on the network and how they interact with it and that basically comes down to providing its ip address uh, its available services and what it can do we're going to do a couple of things. Uh, the first one, as we see over here, when you first see an event come in, is that this is past inspection. Now this, again, by detailing to Anvil what devices are on the network and how they interact, we can then determine what's a false positive and what isn't. There have been many folks who have tried IDS solutions before and have ultimately failed because of false positives overloading the network. And so this is another handy tool that lets you know Yes, this passed inspection will also tell you if it didn't pass inspection or if we don't have enough information from this device to let you know, to tell you whether it is or is not a false positive. And so getting into the main feature here, when we go to situational awareness, and I guess I should just note also that this is just kind of a test environment. So we're not seeing any external traffic. We're not seeing a lot of traffic at all, um, but all the features we're looking at are live 
fully operational and ready for use on your networks as well with your uh, data and your events. But still, um, looking at this, uh, we get a bird's eye view as to what's going on in the network. Uh, we can immediately change the view uh, from the last 12 hours to the last 90 days. We can even look at all the events in the current data store, which is a, a, a great option for those new to Anvil that might have months of data stored. They can feed that to Anvil and we can tell them what's been happening in the past few months on their network. So looking at our devices that we have as a source. So on, in your environments, these would be your employees, everyone on the inside. Uh, we can immediately see that we're not seeing any risk one or risk two events, which is great. Uh, I always think of uh, Matthew Broderick and war games. Uh, you know, when they went to DEF CON one and two, that's when war almost broke out. And these risks are working the same way. So we don't want to see any risk one or risk two. We are seeing some risk three events uh, from, some, uh, from some of our uh, devices on the network. But that's not of a great concern. It's more like more or less just kind of a high warning, letting you know that some, there's some activity on the network. Now, looking at these devices as a destination, again, uh, this is going to be outside traffic. We can see that no one from the outside is really attacking us or providing any uh, risk one or risk two events. We see a number of risk three events. So again, it's nothing of a great concern. So again, if this were a real network, um, we could immediately see that, well, overall, I'd say the health is generally high that we're not seeing any, again, high risk events. Uh, likewise, uh, should you see these uh, events, you can immediately know, oh, well, this is uh, this is the sales floor. Uh, this is technical support, whatnot. You can know where these um, events are taking place on which devices. So you know, again, quickly, where to place your concentration of efforts to keep the health of your network. All right. Now, um, further, we see the percentage of grouped events and the percentage of total system events, letting us know that we're seeing an, of the devices that we have selected, we're seeing a lot of their traffic. However, we're not seeing all of the, all of the devices on the network because as we're seeing the total number of events that have gone through here, we're not seeing all of them. So again, this shows us that there are some more further devices that we need to detail and we need to add to Anvil. Now, there are some further tools that we're gonna jump into here that can help with that process. With the latest versions of Anvil also, we've incorporated NMAP support, a fabulous uh, port scanning utility that allows us to do a number of things. Uh, first of all, um, just talking about this uh, uh, task of adding these devices to your network, we can do this um, in a couple of ways. First, I'm gonna show you how we can do it manually and obtain that information. Now, many folks have a list of devices and what they can do on the network, but many folks don't, and they're adding more sites that are adding uh, more hosts. And so this is a tool that can help. Offensive reconnaissance. Now, we can enter any host or IP address, and we can obtain their operating system fingerprint. We can obtain their up-down state and their available services. Essentially, everything we need to detail the Anvil, what's going on. Now, I'm showing you this as a manual way, and I'll, I'll take you through a few steps here, but this can also be set up as an automatic task. Now, the, I, I guess where you might be wanting to use this and where we have this disclaimer here, you may want to be careful because in some companies and countries, uh, this info, this, uh, these tools are not uh, available or they're uh, illegal to use. Um, but using this in, in an automated state, uh, we have a system that can um, perform automatic actions based on any number of criteria that you set. So we could easily set up that, uh, well, should we have a risk one event coming from uh, this region or these IP addresses, then I want you to perform offensive reconnaissance. Uh, by so doing, many would-be attackers can be put off the trail because they know that someone's actually monitoring the network and so they back off. Um, and so just to do a manual scan here, I'll show you exactly how this works. I'm just gonna scan the box that we're viewing now as we arm the scan and perform it, it's gonna take us right to reconnaissance management where everything is available, um, all of our scans. These are the results that are not yet available, but just with a quick refresh, they come back pretty quickly. And there they are. Again, showing us the latest NMAP version and uh, Anvil's gonna work with version 6.0 and above. And I really do recommend the latest 6.25, especially in the realm of the fingerprint results, they are much more accurate. And so we can see that we're looking at an Apple device. We can see what ports are open uh, and exactly what's available on this 
box. And this is the information that we can then feed to Animal to let it know what's happening on our network. Now, another way to do it, and also by use of uh, Nmap, is a tool just that we call our network host scanner. And this is also an automated tool. And what it does after we create a network, uh, give it a name, we can give it a description and just a basic IP range, it's going to routinely scan our network for any new hosts. This is especially helpful in areas where you might have the bring your own device uh, idea. You might have a lot of hosts coming and going on the network. Now, we can change the frequency at which Anvil scans. By default, it's going to be every 24 hours. But we can, we can detail that even on every five minutes if you want. And what this is going to do, when we go to our live monitor here, I'm going to view just our Anvil console. Because in addition to having our IDS and uh, syslog sensors, the console itself is also essentially acting as a sensor to present different console events. Uh, whether it be someone successfully logging into the network, uh, or you might see a failed login attempt, which is a, a great warning to you, uh, should someone uh, unauthorized uh, be trying to access the console. And it's also letting you know uh, during the scan how many hosts were found. Now, we can, uh, again, change our risk level here. And we had an event long ago that's showing us that Anvil did find a new host. And within these details, it's showing us uh, directly that it found one new host. And when we look at these event details right here in the payload, it's showing us the uh, IP that it found. Not only that, it did further scans. And if I go to device management, I'll show you that it found, this is the uh, actual uh, host that it discovered. And it obtained this further information and already automatically detailed it right into device management. And this is the area where you actually detail those um, different devices that are on the network. This is, uh, these are the two devices that I manually added. And even here, I can, I can give it further information if I want. I can uh, go ahead and add uh, more configured services. But all of this information was automatically found and imported right into the system. So this is another uh, device that uh, I was automatically found and, and, not, and now I'm aware of it. Now, our third Nmap feature that we've uh, entailed here is, is essentially our network host scanning, but we also add alerts to it. So it can alert you of these new hosts that you might detect. And that's just what we're going to call our rogue host detection system. And so when we go into um, our options, we'll go into action management. And as I mentioned, this is the system that uh, allows you to create automatic actions based on a number of criteria. I've created one that sends me an email when someone successfully logs into the network. Uh, and here's our rogue host detection. So just looking at this, uh, I'll just edit this and show you exactly what we're seeing, that we've enabled it. Um, and the criteria to match, this signature, this is one of our console events. This is a, essentially the signature ID from that console event that lets us know that one or more hosts was found. And should this trigger, it's going to send me an email. And we can send, I guess, multiple emails in here, uh, which just separated by a comma. And in the email uh, window itself, the body, this is just kind of a skeletal form that's filled in with the information from the particular event that you, uh, I guess, that you uh, enact. And as we see here under our criteria, we have a number of things that we can match. Again, risk level, uh, any certain text that we might find in the payload or the signature itself. And these actions be performed. Again, this is where we can send an email. Or if we want, we could perform offensive reconnaissance. And again, all that information would automatically be uh, found and logged right into our device management and also um, reconnaissance management menus. So those are just, again, some very helpful tools that are available uh, right in our latest versions of Anvil. Now, another one that I wanted to mention, um, again, we're talking about this idea of situational awareness, the idea of complete visibility. Um, our latest packages and offerings for Anvil offer just that. Uh, in the past, uh, and often with other vendors too, you might be looking for a solution based on how many sensors you have, and that's how much you'll pay. Uh, but we've changed that view with Anvil. Uh, that rather than issuing you licenses based on a number of sensors, uh, you know, three Suricata sensors, so three licenses, rather than doing that, 
what we're actually providing is an unlimited sensor capacity license so that without you know any other budget restraints or time restraints you can add every device on your network and again this is an idea that we want you to embrace we want you to add all of your devices uh, add all of your snort and suricata sensors add everything that's capable of uh, external logging or syslog and send that to anvil and which is with the one license that we'll send you you can easily do that there, there aren't any there aren't any restrictions and, and we do have those folks around the world who are <laughs> really have deployed uh, hundreds of snort and suricata and syslog sensors and they're all feeding it right into anvil and it's uh, that all information is being held securely on their machines all the traffic is being monitored and captured everything's right there and so they're not missing a thing and it's all held securely with them now in addition to this uh, this license that you're that you're going to receive uh, we also offer telephone and remote support so that we can dial in to quickly view and diagnose and repair any, any issues that you might be having with your anvil console itself and then in addition to that what you also are going to need um, again matt was talking about uh, getting these daily updates from Suricata, you're going to be getting all updates from Anvil. And so as we come up with minor and major builds, uh, you know, any bug fixes, uh, new features, you're going to receive all of those. And so you're always going to stay up to date with the latest and greatest. And, and you'll have all the tools to utilize those things. So again, uh, always increase your situational awareness and the ability to make quick informed decisions and always keep the health of your network in check. All right. And, and so that's just kind of where we're wrapping up today. Uh, we're, one moment here, we do have a few questions. Let's see here. Okay. Um, Oh, and this one actually we just answered, um, asking you know what what all is included in these uh, packages that it's going to be uh, the license, support, and uh, essentially maintenance or uh, all uh, all feature upgrades and console upgrades. Uh, so that that's that's actually what we're offering. Okay, um, let's see here. And so that's a kind of wrapping up. Looks like uh, all these others have, have kind of been answered between. Uh, Matt and myself just through our presentations. Um, all right. But this is kind of wrapping up our time here today. Uh, again, we want to thank uh, Jennifer for hosting this webinar. We especially want to thank Matt for attending and providing all the fabulous information about uh, both emerging threats and the great rule sets that they offer and Suricata. And we just want to again let you know that these tools are all available to Anvil users. And we're working more closely with them to make sure that these things are tightly integrated. Uh, but we want to thank everyone for coming today. We appreciate your interest, your support. We're looking forward to working with you and, and essentially getting Anvil on your networks so that you, again, can get this full visibility. Um, so I'm just going to throw up our last slide here. So you can see some contact information from us. All right, because we do offer uh, personalized um, live demos of Anvil on your own network so we can show you uh, those features that are most important to you and how they operate. Uh, we have a great support team here that can answer all of your questions. So you can send us an email or contact us. And also, I mean, feel free to download Anvil. We do offer a free download uh, that you can add one sort of Suricata sensor uh, for testing in your own environment. And again, thank you for coming. We appreciate your support and we look forward to working with you in the future.